the House Judiciary Committee, the Rules Committee, and on the subcommittees on Immigration and Border Security, as well as Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security, and Investigations. Prior to Congress, Ken was three times elected District Attorney from Weld County in Colorado. He is also a member of Congress, I think you'll like this, that has actually voted to cut funding to sanctuary cities. He has a 100% rating from Numbers USA. On my immediate left, Mike Gonzalez is the senior fellow in the Catherine and Shelby Colum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Mike was born in Cuba, left Cuba at the age of 12, has spent 20 years as a journalist, beginning uh, reporting on high school sports, as I understand it. Boston, yes and eventually got to the Wall Street Journal for about 11 years and was stationed all over the globe, including such enchanting places as Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Mike has written a book. Uh, it's called A Race for the Future, How Conservatives can, can Break the Liberal Monopoly on Hispanic America. Congress, thank you. <laughs> Congressman Andy Biggs, Newly elected to Congress uh, this last election from Arizona's 5th District, that's the southeast part of the Phoenix Valley, Andy uh, has, prior to Congress, served 14 years in the Arizona legislature, the last four of which were as the Senate President. He's recognized as a champion of the taxpayer from uh, the Americans for Prosperity, a friend of liberty from the Goldwater Institute, has a 100% score as well from Numbers USA, serves on the House Judiciary uh, Committee and on the Committee on Science and Technology. So welcome the panel, if you would, please. <laughs> Let me start with Mike Gonzalez from Heritage. Mike, in your writings, you talk a lot about, oh, I'm sorry, I promised you all an opening statement, didn't I? <laughs> yes. Then let's do that. Mike, why don't you go ahead and, and give us a few remarks off the top. Well, thank you, Bob, and thank you all for being here early this morning. Now, one of the, uh, the impacts that uh, immigration since 65 has had on American society has been has given rise to this argument uh, that a quote-unquote changing demographic requires the implementation of multiculturalism as a political model. And now, when people discuss immigration, they generally talk about numbers. They don't talk about this. They talk about the 11 million illegal immigrants or the, the fiscal or economic impact of immigration, and uh, what I'd like to put on the table today is this impact that the, the application of political multiculturalism has on national identity, culture, sovereignty, and even the nature of the nation state itself. Now, I understand why these two arguments are kept separate. Immigrants did not begin multiculturalism. They do not apply it. It was started by our, our, our political, our cultural elites uh, without any support from anybody, really. Uh, but if immigrants are pressed into the cause of, of supporting multiculturalism in two ways. First, there's the argument of it's done in their name, uh, changing demographic. This is a bogus argument. America has always had changing demographics since 1830s when records were first kept to the present. About an estimated 60, 70 million immigrants from all over the world have come in. We, we have always been multi-ethnic. We have never been multicultural. That is the new thing. The second way is that the immigrants are pressed into the groups, the pan-ethnic groups, that uh, form the, 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 the building blocks of multiculturalism. And these, these groups were started by, by the bureaucracy with no input from anthropologists or science or anything else. I'm talking about Hispanics or Asians or MENA. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, leave it there. And by the way, I think that's completely perverse to do that. I'm going to leave it there but say that this issue of what multiculturalism does has to be solved no matter what we do with immigration. We can do all the vetting we want, but if people come in and then they're assimilated into groups, we're gonna have a problem unless we take care of that. So thank you. Well said, Mike, thank you. So we don't, uh, so we don't consolidate Congress too much. Let me go to Andy Biggs now and then I'll go to Helen and uh, finish up with Ken. Andy. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all for being here today. And let me say, when this country was put together, our founders came over and they had a, a, a very clear notion of what government's supposed to do. It's supposed to be limited, and the main purpose is to protect individual freedoms and rights. 
And when you don't have a boundary, you kind of lose your sense of sovereignty. You don't have that identity of what your national, where your national authority begins, where it ends. We were, our federal government was created by the states. The states have lost their boundaries and sovereignty to the federal government. But right now along our southern border, we have lost the border. The border is not defined anymore, which means that the entire nation is essentially weakened. And so if you want to have a discussion about immigration, the first thing you need to talk about is border security. The next thing is you have to talk about um, removing the inducement, the incentives for people to come here illegally. And then, of course, you have to enforce the laws of the nation. This is a, a highly charged, emotionally charged issue. If we're going to get to an ability to even consider the depth of, of immigration, we have to take care of those first three area issues, uh, issue areas first. So I'm looking forward to the panel. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Helen Kreeble has made a life's mission of this issue, so I'm anxious to, to hear what Helen has to say. As conservatives, which we all are, we need to think about immigration based on those principles that made and still make America great. So I want to quickly run through them. We believe in border security to protect our national sovereignty. We believe in limited government because we believe in self-government. We believe in free markets based on supply and demand and a vital private sector. We believe in the rules of law without over-criminalization. We believe in equality, which means no special deals for special groups. Uniform law. The immigration discussion today is focused on border security, which is essential and necessary. But good border security requires a functioning guest worker program. And that's why President Trump has said the wall must have a gate. We now need a conversation about how that gate works, <laughs> how we decide who comes through that gate. And that means people who have a self-supporting job and pass a criminal background check. For, th <laughs> For those people, the process should be simple, efficient, and uniform. It should have nothing to do with green cards and citizenship or public benefits, and everything to do with market forces which determine the number of jobs that need to be filled, and the private sector which fills them unmired by red tape. A program like that will grow the economy and not the government. <laughs> Congressman Buck. First, I want to correct the moderator. I am to the far right of this panel, not to the left of the panel. So, it's an important visual. Uh, I, I, just very quickly, I think it's really important for us as Americans to understand that uh, illegal immigrants are certainly to blame uh, for part of this problem, but we also have to put blame on the politicians who don't have the backbone to fix this system. We have to put blame on the government bureaucrats uh, and, and enforcement agencies who aren't doing their job and aren't doing it well enough. We have to put blame uh, on employers for hiring people who are in this country illegally. And if we're going to fix this system, we need to uh, uh, not only put blame uh, where it belongs, but also make sure we fix it uh, in a multifaceted way. Thank you, Ken. All right. Now uh, to Mike with the first question. You talk a lot about multiculturalism. You did in your opening statement and this diversity agenda. Expand just a little bit on what you mean about that. And, and if you're correct, I think you are, uh, in identifying the problem, what policy should we be adopting to solve the problem? Sure. Look, it's this idea that we're a nation of groups with group rights and, uh, and group traits and characteristics, uh, which is really being used uh, throughout our system and the schools at all levels of, of government and uh, moving away. So it's group proportionalism, moving away from the idea that we're all individuals with God-given rights and equal under the law. And this is what the, the country has been based on. 
So we need, this is a, a very important thing uh, to, to, to not accede to this anymore, to, not to give in to this anymore, but to f uh, fight it in every way we can. And one way to fight it is to stop doing the bad things we're doing. Uh, let's stop thinking of the nation in terms of groups, uh, starting with all the uh, government forms that we fill, starting with the census, uh, and let's stop teaching kids uh, to hate America. Uh, they stop teaching America the way it is, you know, uh, the, the way it was founded, the, the, the fact that it's a beacon of freedom uh, and, it, and, it's, and it has an inordinate amount of, of freedom and prosperity. Uh, and then let's start doing the right things, you know, assimilating immigrants the way we used to do it when we had huge waves like in the 1830s and 1840s, and then the Ellis Island immigrants were also assimilated. My grandfather was one of those. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Congressman Biggs, um, last week in National Review, I saw an article, had this headline, there's nothing new about Trump's deportation policy. But if you followed the press, you would think that everything was new and somehow radical and extreme. Um, I, the article points out that under President Obama, almost three million deportations took place. I did the arithmetic, that works out to about 6,600 per week over an eight-year period, Secretary Kelly, new Homeland Security Secretary Kelly, said that they actually arrested in the approximately week that uh, the new program was in place, only 680, about one-tenth the number that Obama was, uh, was deporting. Yet the press, again, would give you a very different story. Tell me, you come from Arizona, how big is the problem and, and, and and what do we do to fix it? You know, the problem, the problem is, is huge, and, and we won't get into the fake news issue that uh, you just mentioned, but we'll talk about, about the I numbers. I did give you the opportunity. Yeah, you did. I appreciate that. <laughs> you teed it up for me. I'm, I'm going to pass on that one. Um, because I think what we need to remember is that 475,000 people were apprehended at the border uh, last year. 475,000. That doesn't include, we, we don't know how many people get in. People speculate. But the, the lowest multiplier I've ever heard is four. And if that's four times, then you're just under two <coughs> people actually entering this country every year. And, that, and for us as, as Arizonans, we're kind of at the point of the spear there because um, the biggest human smuggling, drug smuggling corridor is the Tucson sector. And that means if you're the biggest on the U.S. border, you're the biggest in the, in the world. And we have, it's the busiest. They're coming through. We have uh, large stre stretches of uh, desert land that, that's very hard to surveil, and it is massive. So in our state alone, for instance, you're looking at anywhere from 12 to 13 percent of the prison population are illegal aliens. And we now have, we, we now have a sheriff who's reversed course, of course, but in Maricopa County, four and a half million people, this sheriff was not going to hold criminal illegal aliens illegal aliens who committed additional crimes. He was not going to hold them for ICE to take. And in the last couple of years, we've had over 5,000 criminally violent illegal aliens, such that we've had murders, rapes, kidnappings, uh, it, it, additional aggravated assaults. This is the problem. It is mag it's a magnificent problem in the sense that it's huge. And it's very, uh, it's very disingenuous for the press to indicate that there is something inherently different in what uh, President Trump is doing. The only thing that, uh, and it gets back to my opening statement, that we see him doing is he's enforcing the law. And it must be enforced interior, in the interior. Helen, um, a lot of attention, understandably, as Andy just articulated, on border security. Uh, but as uh, the President has also said, he thinks America needs to have a big gate. So there's, a, with all the attention on the illegal problem, legal immigration reform has maybe gotten precious little discussion. I know you've given this a great deal of thought. Tell us what those thoughts are, if you can. Well, I think when we criminalize everybody without giving them an opportunity to have a legal way to do things, we've got things backwards. 
So what we need is a program. It, it, the federal government's job is to do citizenship and green cards. But work permits is about work. It's about the private sector and the business people. And to set up a program there that is um, legal is important. So we're suggesting that you set up private employment agencies that um, have databases of every job that's available that needs to be filled, has a database of every worker that wants them, makes a match, uh, and then sends those workers through a, a sec national security um, section, uh, comes back. If you have a self-supporting job and you have never committed a crime, you would be issued a work permit like the red card. Um, it, is a, it has a microchip in it like the cards you use everywhere. It is absolute security that the person who presents it is the person it was issued to. You can scan it at the border. The police can scan it. An employer can scan it. It is, um, costs $10 and takes about three days to make. And it's a way of regularizing, of allowing employers to find legal workers when they need them that they can't find otherwise and pursue their own American dream. And it allows workers to come in who have no way of applying for work permits in the United States. So what we've done is encourage them, if you want to work in this country, you've got to come illegally because there's no way you can come legally. And so border security is having this card where you can come through the gate to a defined job and have never committed a crime. So that's what we are looking at as a way to solve it. And if your American dream is your business and you can't find labor like the dishwasher, then you have to close your business or hire illegal people. And then you get criminalized and go to jail for three years. You can't criminalize millions of American citizens without giving them a way to move their businesses legally. Ken, a good share of your career has been spent in law enforcement. You've been a DA, a three-term DA. Now you're in Congress. Um, tell me from your perspective, I should tell our audience as well, I think, Ken's district in northeastern Colorado is dominated by a college town as well as one of the richest agricultural and energy producing regions in the entire nation. So there's, uh, there's a, a lot of need for laborers in that district, and some of them I know are illegal. You know that as well. Tell us about this, the state of the problem. <clears throat> How big is it? What should be done? And maybe more realistically, uh, what will Congress actually do? Um, I can talk about what should be done much more than what Congress will do. It'll be a much longer conversation. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things we have to do, and, and this piggybacks on, on what Helen was saying, uh, we, we need welfare reform. We have to put Americans to work and not give them a free ride. We need to make sure that, that people who are in this country, United States citizens, aren't getting uh, any form of welfare if they're able-bodied and, and don't have uh, child care or other reasons not to work. So, so one thing is put Americans back to work, determine how many people we need. We need to strengthen our E-Verify system. The, the president has made some uh, uh, moves already to strengthen uh, border security by increasing the number of border patrol. Uh, we need to deport criminal aliens. There's nothing that makes Americans matter than to see someone who is in this country illegally committing a crime, and there's nothing that really hurts our debate on what should we do with people who are here illegally uh, than, than the people that are committing the crimes. And so we've got to deal uh, forcefully, and unfortunately we took a step backwards in Maricopa County, but we've got to deal forcefully with that issue. So uh, I think Congress will, and I think the Judiciary Committee will lead the way along with the Homeland Security Committee in the House, uh, start working on, on many of those programs. Good. <clears throat> Mike, I've, I've read a, a, an interview you gave some time ago. You mentioned that the wall, which has been popularized <laughs> in this last election, uh, as important as it is, it's, it's probably not a silver bullet. You want to explain what you meant by that? Yeah, let me do it quickly because I see we're running out of time. Uh, it, it's important to have borders. We need to have safe borders, strong borders. A nation state needs borders. Without, uh, without territorial citizenship, you devolve into citizenship by ethnic group or race or religion. So people who think that it's cool to get rid of borders really do not understand the, 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 impl the implications of, of what, they're, what they're seeking. 
But that's not the only thing we need, because if we just bring people in and keep the system as it is, then people are going to be, as I said, assimilated into groups or, or made militant into groups. Uh, you know, Alejandro Portes, uh, a, a demographer, has looked into this, and kids go into high school identifying themselves. This is a long longitudinal stu study identifying themselves as American, come out at the other end of four years, identifying themselves into one of the, the, the groups that the government has set up for us. So something's happening there. And also, this is true for radicalization. It's not really the immigrant, that, the, the guy that, that comes in. It's his, his child, the 1.5 generation or the second generation that becomes radicalized. So if all we do is, is have borders, which are important, and a nation state needs borders, and we do nothing to fix the system, then we're not really going to be doing the job, I think. Good answer. Um, Helen, um, you, uh, you've said as well in, a, in an earlier interview that I saw that we almost, and you referred to it just a minute ago in your, in your uh, previous answer, we almost require businesses to hire illegals. You want to expand on that just a, a little bit more and maybe more importantly for this group, what conservative principles ought to be applied by Andy and Ken when they go back to Congress and fix this problem? Well, I want to ask you, first of all, um, does government do everything best? <laughs> so should the entire foreign labor market be left in their hands? Because they decide how many workers in each category are needed in their little offices with no relationship to the marketplace. So we need 15,000 construction workers, and that, that's all the visas you're going to get. But 100,000 are needed. So what is the construction owner going to do? He can't get the workers he needs. And he either closes his business or he hires illegal workers. So when you make it that way, and then you're going to criminalize him if he does it, you've got a boondoggle. And the same is true for workers who know that we're the land of opportunity. And they can't, it's illegal for the government. The government has set up a program so full of red tapes, both for the employer and the person who wants to come. If you want a job here, you have no right to apply for a work permit yourself. None. So, you know, the job's there. How are you going to come? You're going to try to sneak across the border illegally. If those people had a way to go properly through a process that is managed in the private sector efficiently by business people, you've got a huge improvement on border security because they're going to go through the gate that Trump talked about. We need to start talking about that gate soon. Andy, speaking of gates, uh, I think Arizona is one of those. Um, I know from experience, having been there, I think we probably all understand that in the Phoenix Valley, at least three industries that uh, dominate that valley, construction, agriculture, and hospitality, there's a heavy reliance on illegal immigrant help. Can we do what Helen suggests, secure our border, modernize the system for legal immigration, not only get the labor we need to keep the economy moving the way it is, but as I know you and Ken, congressional leadership, and certainly our new president want to do, grow this economy, can we do that all in a relatively short period of time? Well, you know, we're talking about a massive and complex problem. So let me, let me just say this. Uh, I appreciate the talk of the gate, but um, you don't start building, uh, you're building anything by building the gate. You build the wall and plan for the gate. I agree. And so, so we have to secure the border. That is, that's got to be job one, and, and that takes a wall, it takes technology, it takes boots on the ground, all that this administration has said they're committed to doing. Similarly, they are talking about, um, I think President Trump calls it a beautiful gate. <laughs> and uh, he, wants, he wants a gate, and he wants, he wants people to have access. But you know what, if, you, if folks are here, and they are then uh, applying for these jobs that, that Helen's talking about, and these cards, that, would, that has the potential of being very problematic. They should, if you're going to move that direction, and this is why I always say you have to do those three, same three things first, border, internal enforcement, and you have to take away the inducements. But if you have an inducement saying, come in here and apply in America for this card, then you have an inducement to be here, perhaps even illegally. 
if you're going to al allow this type of, of program, you'd want them in their home country <laughs> to obtain that, that card and then, and then work it out that way. We have some success stories, even in Arizona, at the San Luis Port of Entry, which deals with agricultural uh, workers, where you have literally tens of thousands of people who cross legally every day and then return home at night. There, there, are, there are prototypes for how you can do this. Ken, knowing you as I do, you've spent, uh, again, a, a lot of your career one way or the other dealing with the rule of law and enforcing that rule of law. But I know a sense of fairness and application of that law is critically important to you as well. Tell us a two-part question. How do you strike that right balance of being both humane and fair and still enforcing the laws? And, and, um, and tell us, too, um, I think we probably all have our definition, but you said on the Committee of Jurisdiction, what does extreme vetting actually look like, especially as it relates to, to these uh, people coming from, from places that we don't want them necessarily coming from? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, on, on the rule of law, uh, you don't uh, enforce the rule of law by using excuses like uh, prosecutorial uh, discretion and other things not to enforce the law. The reason we have a rule of law is so that people uh, in this country uh, feel a sense of fairness. Uh, and not only does it give us a sense of fairness, it also uh, levels the playing field. Uh, it gives people certainty in their actions. Um, and, and so I think, I think the rule of law is absolutely essential when we talk about uh, immigration. Extreme vetting uh, is something that applies uh, to the, on the refugee side of, of uh, this debate. And, uh, really what, what uh, the President, I believe, is talking about, what Congress is talking about, is when we're dealing with countries uh, that are hot spots for terrorism, that uh, are uh, destabilized as a result of civil war, uh, we, we don't have the ability to go into those countries and find records to determine whether someone has uh, health issues or criminal background or uh, has been radicalized in some way. And, and those countries, uh, we either should not take refugees from or we should take them uh, after we have extremely vetted them, meaning that, that we have a number of sources uh, that, that make this uh, person reliable uh, safely uh, in this country. Thank you. We're, we're going to open it up to you all. Uh, we've got mics there, and somebody's going to be holding up a sign, as well as here. And I think we've also got some Twitter questions that maybe have come in. Uh, where's my Twitter? Per there she is. Do I have a Twitter question? Yes. Zachary Schubert asks, what would be the correct approach for illegal immigrants that are already in our country? That sounds like a Helen question. <laughs> what, would be the, what would be the approach for illegal immigrants already in our country? Yes. Helen, you want to take a swipe at that? You know, you're not going to deport 11 or 12 or 15 million illegal immigrants. Why not? Because you can't. It's, it's logistically impossible. And I think that the thing you need to consider is that if that person has got a self-supporting um, job and um, has never committed a crime in the United States, that they have no path to citizenship, no path to a green card, and no use of our social services, to a allow them to apply for a simple work permit so that they are here legally is a good idea. Let's go over here. Very good, Mrs. Go over here to my left, and then I'll come over here, okay? Hi, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Zach Henry. I'm from Houston, Texas, one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the country. My question is, what is the most conservative, effective approach President Trump can take to the Dreamers, and more specifically, DACA? I'm going to toss that to Ken if you want to take a swipe at that. <laughs> Ken. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have to tell you, I think we go back to fairness uh, again in this situation. We, we, we in this country, in, in terms of the history of law, uh, have never blamed uh, uh, young children for uh, the actions of their parents. So we've got to take that into account. Now, if someone comes here at age 17, it's different than someone comes here at six months. And so I think we need a, a standard that gives our country uh, the ability uh, to, to be fair uh, to, to, to young people. I am not in favor 
of, of legalizing uh, dreamers, and I haven't been in favor of legalizing dreamers, but okay. uh, as a matter of as a matter of applying the rule of law, we've got to figure out how, how to deal with young people who uh, know no other country other than America and, and do it properly. I, I for one, uh, believe, my son uh, is in the military now, and I believe that uh, if people uh, are willing, if they come here at six months and have spent 18 years in this country and they're willing to serve this country, uh, then maybe that is the reward, but it isn't just a matter of giving them citizenship. <laughs> Helen has asked that she can comment on that as well, so quickly, Helen. Just briefly, there's an ethical issue of great importance here, which is that we encourage these people to come forward out of the shadows, to be identified, to identify their parents, in the, and said you're not going to be deported. We need to remember that, because it's a betrayal to now deport them. Let me go over to the, to, on the right here. My name is Martha Stamp, and I live in a sanctuary state of Rhode Island. And my concern is the health of folks coming into this country and how, when we are hurting some of our American citizens, how are we going to make sure that they're not bringing in disease. Andy, uh, you, want to, you want to bite at that apple? Sure. We all know that we've seen an increase in, in uh, diseases in this country that we thought were uh, basically uh, exterminated from the country and, and were gone. And part of that is because we have, uh, whether we have refugees, but we also have people crossing the border, the southern border, we have no idea where they've been. We have no idea what, what kind of health they are, they're in. And that's in part because we haven't secured the border. It's in part because we don't enforce the laws. It's in part because we excuse and we provide inducements for people to come here. Um, it, the only way you're going to know where these people are is, is you provide inducements for them to leave the country. That's going to help our, our health situation. And, and you provide inducements for them to leave by... And you need to realize this. Um, we just had a lady who was deported. She had two kids. She lived here for 20 years in, in Maricopa County. She was, had been convicted, however, of ID theft. You never saw that in the news reports. She'd been convicted of ID theft. Her attorney said, well, you know, if you're here illegally, you've, you've, you, you almost have to commit ID theft. And they treat that as if that is some kind of victimless crime. And the reason I bring it up is because we've got to incentivize people to stay home and not come into this country, and that will help uh, impart our, our health situation. Let's go to one of our good volunteers. Thank you for volunteering here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Stephen Elliott, and I'm a senior at Penn State University. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> With the cost of applying for citizenship being around $700, do you think that making it more affordable would incentivize potential immigrants to go through the correct channels? I'm going to ask Michael to, to handle that question because you've actually talked about how we could get this uh, legal immigration wrong if we're not careful. Well, actually, uh, I appreciate your question, but I think that we need to make the uh, naturalization process more meaningful, not less meaningful. I think that we, it needs to be a truly transformative experience. Uh, we need to ask, we need to, they, they, they need to demonstrate that they speak English to, at, at, I think right now it's an, at an eighth grade level. Uh, but, but that is, and, the, and let me tell you why English is important. We're a constitutional republic that requires a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of citizenship involvement. And if we are not all talking in the same language and debating the issues in the same language, we're not going to be able to keep this, this constitutional republic. Uh, but uh, let me... So I think what we need to do is make the naturalization process not easier but more meaningful. So people understand that they are going through a tra it's a transformative process. They're leaving something behind and they're being welcomed into a new American family. So I don't know that what you're suggesting is a, is a, is a, is a, a good approach to doing what I think ought to be done. So, uh, Much more complicated than just the cost of it. Right. It's really a, a, a process and what the end point is. 
civics, which we need to yeah. teach to everybody, but we also need to teach to the people coming in. What is America about? What are our values? Heritage is going to be publishing a paper soon on what our core values are. Thank you. Go over here for another quick one. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Floyd from Potomac, Maryland. Uh, we started Help Save Maryland many years ago to target some of our politicians who allow illegal immigration. So my question is, members of Congress, what will you do to help President Trump target politicians who allow sanctuary policies and sanctuary cities? Because this has to stop. Congressman Buck, I think you've been there the longest, probably got the best perspective. Well, I'll tell you, the, the problem with sanctuary cities is it's popular for the politicians to create a sanctuary city. They're, they are uh, typically um, uh, more liberal uh, hotspots, and uh, what we have to do is to make sure that those people understand that uh, they receive federal education funding, they receive federal transportation funding, they receive other funding from the federal government. If they refuse to cooperate with the federal government, the federal government's going to refuse to cooperate with them. It's that plain and simple. And, and if, if those sources of funding dry up, uh, they will not be as popular in their home cities. And, and uh, we have to make sure that we have citizen involvement and we are encouraging citizen involvement. But uh, uh, making a decision about uh, uh, refusing to cooperate with the federal government uh, should, should have a cost to it. Okay, we're going to push our time envelope a little bit and get one more question in. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm from Philadelphia. And uh, my question is, in the context of America First, what do you make of foreign students that graduate from United States college, well, colleges in America? Should they stay or be on their way? Helen, you want the last one? It, if they have a self-supporting job, they find one, they take one through a private employment agency and have gone through a national security test, they should be welcome and we should keep them. But to keep them without that very careful vetting, I think, is, is foolish and quick and fast. We want to keep our people who are, are trained here, but we need a uniform system for them to remain. Thank you. <clears throat> let, thank you. Let, me, let, me thank, let me thank everyone. They've given us the wrapped up sign already uh, some time ago. So my apologies to those that wanted to ask more questions. I know we could probably spend the entire morning, maybe the entire day on this subject, but let me ask all of you. This is a tough one. <clears throat> it's a complicated one, and one that has caused a lot of people to get to different solutions for the same problem. Please uh, give my panelists one more round of applause. I think they did a marvelous job. Thank you, Bob. Well done.